Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for coming to tonight's event here at Palace City of Books. Uh, before we get started, I want to remind you that you can follow us on all forms of social media, including Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Uh, some of the exciting events we have coming up include AJ Jacobs, Douglas Stewart, and Alton Brown. You can check out the rest of our enticing lineup by going to our website, pals.com. In-person events are back in full swing, so when looking at the events page, please note whether it mentions Zoom or lists a store or location because we don't want you to be disappointed. Tonight, we are so very excited to welcome Marlon James back to PALS. Uh, Marlon James is the author of the New York Times bestselling National Book Award finalist, uh, Black Leopard, Red Wolf, and the Booker Prize winning A Brief History of Seven Killings. He's also the author of the book Night of Night Women and John Crow's Devil. In addition to the Booker Prize, his novels have won the American Book Award, the Los Angeles Times Ray Bradbury Prize for Science Fiction, the Honest Bill Wolf Board Book Award, and the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. Uh, Marlon is here to discuss his newest title, Moon Witch Spider King. Here it is right here. Um, and the second book in his Dark Star trilogy, So Go Long, the Moon Witch takes center stage and gives her own account of what happened to the mysterious boy who disappeared and how she plotted and fought, triumphed and failed as she looked for him. It's also the story of a century-long feud seen through the eyes of a 177-year-old witch that Sogolong has had with the AC Chancellor to the King. It is said that AC works so closely with the King that together they are like the eight limbs of one spider. Uh, AC's, power, AC's power is considerable and deadly. It takes brains and courage to challenge him, which Sogolong does for reasons of her own. Both a brilliant narrative device, seeing the story told in Black Leopard, Red Wolf from the perspective of an adversary and a woman, as well as a fascinating battle between different versions of Empire, Moon Witch, Spider King, devolves into Sogolon's world as she fights to tell her own story. Uh, he'll be joined in conversation by Benjamin Percy. Benjamin Percy has won a Whiting Award, a Compton Prize, two Pushcart Prizes, an NEA Fellowship, and the iHeart Radio Award for Best Scripted Podcast. He is the author of the novel, The Ninth Medal, among others. Uh, tonight's event will include a Q&A portion, so please ask any questions down in the Q&A box below instead of in the chat box, so that way Benjamin will be able to find them a lot faster. Uh, if you see anyone ask a question that you also want to know the answer to, please click the like button so that he will know that this is a question that isn't to be missed. Uh, throughout the event, I'll be dropping the links of both Marlon and Benjamin's books in the chat, so that way you can click them and support us and them. Uh, now, please give a warm welcome to Marlon James and Benjamin Percy. I'm just imagining the thunderous applause out there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's been too long, my friend. I know. Yeah. God. We've and known each other a long time, you know, teaching in the same places, conferencing in the same places, living in the same places. And uh, I wish we could be doing this in person. Always I was going to go. Everything you just mentioned is now done up by Zoom. I know. This digital world where it's a weird one. I'd rather be talking smart and hoisting some beers in person, but here we are. Mm. So I think you're going to kick it off for us by reading something extraordinary. Oh, Jesus. Wow. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> I was going to, you know, so, okay, I'm going to read. So um, you guys got to, um, who, uh, if you just joined in, um, you got a synopsis of what Moon with Spider King is about. So the section I'm going to read is a scene where Sogolon is still pretty, pretty young, maybe not even 15, but through bad luck ends up in a brothel. And um, what, so Sogolon ends up a, as a brothel, but Sogolon manages to be the only person who nobody has slept with because she has, a, she, she figures out how to escape that fate nearly every night until she stole something from a person, a talisman. And the problem is the talisman, something she did set forth this demon that burst into the whole, into this, this brother hunting her down. And um, the, the, uh, the, so she, this demon, this demon called an Okundunka burst into the house of ill repute, chasing on everybody, tearing limb from limb. And finally chases her, chases Dom Sogolon, who tried to escape. And this thing is standing right behind, right in front of her. And just when you think he's about to do something, this woman shows up behind him as if the woman is in charge of the monster. So it says, um, 
And it's just written in her in a, her kind of dialect. Just, he shriek and mash the chair. He, the thing. So high his head scraped the ceiling, one hand thin and weak looking, and the other thick as his body and touching the floor. Two legs tall as trees, but one shorter than the other. He shift and scramble like a spider, slamming down his big hand and smashing tables and urns and vases and throwing whatever he wrap his long fingers around. Then he see the girl and shriek again. He goes straight for her. She climbed the ladder fast. She never climbed anything so fast and run to her room. The smashing, the shrieking, the screaming moving closer until the little door rip off. The beast still screeching. The girl is shaking so hard that each blink scatter tears. Better thank the gods you're not a boy thief or I'd be calling 10 men to pull the ukundunga out of your little shithole, the woman says. She, a lady looking like somebody of great nobility and importance, her dark lips and wide nose in a frown, her annoyed eyebrows sitting below a pattern of white dots that run down her left cheek, an igia on her head like a large black flower, and a long white basotho blanket around her shoulders with the black pattern of a warrior with spear and shield, a tall woman and wide, though she's not fat. She looks like she can hold all her children at once. Cheeks of a woman who laughs without warning, without joke. The little girl is trembling. The Ukundunga pawing at her sleeping sheets as if trying to pull her in. Where is it, little girl? The little girl can't get words out. The talisman, little fool. My little figure in Onyx. Don't make me ask for it again or I'll let him search you. The Ukundunga lowers his head right in front of her. A head long like a horse. Eyes like a wolf, teeth like a crocodile, breath like she don't know. They are one, you understand me? The Ukundunka and the talisman, they are one. Let me tell you a story. Once, long after we long married, I said to my husband, dearest husband, everybody know that you are an important man. Everybody know that it's important business that keep you out late at night. The gods know I worry. I worry so much, I ask a conjurer close in spirit to make something to keep my husband safe. Yes, husband, I say, you carry this talisman always and Ukundunka will protect you, an important man like you with enemies everywhere. Why, you could be in a ditch. So every night, if I flip the hourglass more than five times and there's no sign of my husband, I send this Ukundunka searching for him. To keep him safe, you understand me. Lo, one night, he not only come home late, but he come home without it. Lost it, he say. He said, don't bother find it, for I don't know where it gone. I said, don't worry, husband. I'll soon find it and deal with who take it. Now look at it resting in the bosom of a whore. I'm not a whore. You're in a whorehouse. Odds not good you're a nun. I'm not a whore. You're not the cook. I'm not a whore, oh. Then why this room smell of men? The little girl have no answer. She could have said that, yes, the room stunk of men, but none of that stink is on her. But the talk of sleeping poisons would lead to Miss Azura finding out. The noble woman eyed her deep, inspecting her. I, I never whore. I never whore with none of them. Never, eh? I rob them. The little girl is getting more disturbed by the woman's stare than by the Okundunka's hiss. Gold, cowry, money notes, talk to me, girl. Little girl could do nothing but stare at her again. I, I take whatever they ha that shouldn't be hanging loose, and I keep it. For Mrs. Zora, give us nothing. Nothing at all. Your clothes, we buy. I said she don't give us nothing except for one thing. She give all of us a rape the first time she sell us and charge the man triple money. So I mix them a portion, then I rob them. Huh. So they take nothing from you, but you take plenty from them. See here, girl, you in the wrong house. And not leaving one user for another. Who say you even have use? The little girl leave with the noble woman that night. Miss Azora said nothing. Miss Azora don't move from the spot where the Ukundunka threw her. So who knows what is the fate of her? The noble woman asked her her name. I don't have none. What? What do, little, what do people call you? Little one, little dung, little girl, little whore, forbidden lily, enough. 
You choose a name, and that is what we will call you. I call my mother Sogolon. See the girl take her dead mother's name 170 and seven years ago. 170 and seven times that the great gourd of the world spin around the sun. Sogolon. Thank you. Hell yeah. That was great. I hear your virtual applause. <laughs> I feel it <laughs> thundering from afar. No, the thing I love about that scene is the way that it seesaws in so many different directions. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm reminded of moments like the one in Jaws when they're in the belly of the Indian, uh, of, the, of the orca, and they're recalling uh mm -hmm. scar stories you know they're talking about how you know here's where a moray eel bit me here's where a thresher mm -hmm. shark ripped into me and then it comes up like what's that tattoo right there on his arm you know mm -hmm. as they're giggling as they're getting drunk and he's like oh that's the uss indianapolis chief and he launches mm -hmm. into that story about the sinking of the indianapolis after delivering the bomb the Hiroshima mm -hmm. bomb and how they were floating in the water for days on end and the sharks came in and mm -hmm. tore them all apart. And in the same sort of way, like the scene you just read, it, you know, it goes, instead of going from like funny to terrifying, because mm -hmm. that scene in Jaws sort of reminds me of somebody giving you a tickle and then punching you in the stomach. Instead, <laughs> in the scene that you just read, it, it's almost like we have this sudden onslaught, this interruption of mm -hmm. normalcy and and it's just like terror in your face but then it turns mm -hmm. into like uh, a sort of funny rapport between the two and yeah. then it turns again and becomes solemn and mm -hmm. meaningful and it's you know i feel like that's my experience in a microscopic way of the whole book mm -hmm. in that you know you never let your reader feel like they're on stable ground yeah, I mean, because I never feel as a writer that I'm on stable ground. I, you know, um, I kind of know what I'm going to write and kind of know how my story, well, this story is different in that, I, I mean, all three novels, you you know how it ends. You know how they end. Um, but by and large, I, have, I don't have a clue. Like people think, for example, the third book, I don't have a, I don't have a flipping clue where it's going to go. <laughs> and I think, you know, and, and even at the, at the point of writing, I still don't know, because for me, and this happened, and, I, and it's not like I've been doing this all the while, I've been doing this since Brief History, where I want to be as surprised as a writer as I hope the reader is, and that the characters go through these things that complicate themselves in ways that they wouldn't have seen, because I didn't see it. And... um and that may be why these books are so damn long but <laughs> but that's it it's it's sort of being very open-ended about where the story was would go and how how they how, and how they get there so it's not just that the the plot continually surprises me the way in which they react to it and the way in which a scene can swing from sad to funny to moving to ridiculous to you know to terrifying um, because I think, you know, for me, even, you know, I, the reader should feel that all bets are off. Yeah. I think with, with a story and, and, and it has to, I mean, it certainly felt that way when I was writing it. That's such an interesting way to write. It's the way that Don, Dan Sean writes as well. He says mm -hmm. that, you know, for every short story that he hammers out, he usually has about 200 pages that he tosses mm -hmm. away to get to those yeah. 15. Um, and he says that if he knows where he's going, he finds himself bored by the process. I am so bored. I remember the, 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 what was supposed to be my third novel. I was going to write this novel on Weimar era Germany. And I knew everything about, I mean, I knew every, I knew pretty much everything about Weimar era Germany. Um, and I remember just plotting it and plotting it and talking about it and just talking about it so much to so many people. Um, uh, if it was, if there was a conference, that's the book I talked about, right? That I'm writing next. And then I sat down to write this thing and I literally sat down and my fingers at this on the keyboard and I went, oh my God, I'm already bored. <laughs> and I never wrote that novel. I you know, hope so, you know, somebody should, but I, yeah, actually it's already written alone in Berlin, but, <laughs> but yeah, I was already bored. And I think that, um, I have no interest at all in a story where I already know where it's going to go. Uh, and that's um, the way that, 
you know, if you're if you're working for TV, if you're working for comics, right? That's the way they push you over and over. Is mm. they want that blueprint up front so they can say, you know, exactly what. Yeah, happened. but then they come with this bullshit that they also want it surprising. I'm like, pick one. <laughs> <laughs> You know what's especially interesting about your process, though, is that you have these three books, and I'm really interested in talking about the way you structured this series, because you have these three books, and each novel stands alone, mm -hmm. but also speaks to the other, rubs up against the other. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's smart for a few reasons. One, I mean, in a really mercenary way, it's smart because you fight attrition, right? Because in a standard mm -hmm. sort of series, when one book follows the other, you know, fewer people pick up the second book, fewer mm -hmm. people pick up the third book because they have to right. have been following all along. But yeah. you fight that, you fight that by having them stand apart, stand alone. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also, I think it's just a reinvention of the way we think about a series, right? Like it's a continuation, sure, but it's also a revision or it's also a mm -hmm. conversation. Yeah, right. it's but it's it's not a new thing. That's the thing. It's um, not even in literary fiction. I mean, in a lot of ways, Alexandra Quartet is that. Um, Jane Garnham's Old Filth trilogy is 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 kind of that. Um, well, by and large, we usually see that with different writers just going back to the same subject matter. So you have Huckleberry Finn, and you had this novel that came out maybe a decade ago called Finn, which I highly recommend. Um, which was the novel Huckleberry Finn told from the point of view of Huckleberry Finn's horrible father. It's it's a great novel. I'm surprised people don't talk about it much. Um, and then um, Coover just did Huck Out West. But I was trying something that, that where I wrote all three of them yeah. as opposed to that. I, yeah, I also, um, one of the things that I remember growing up uh, my grandfather telling me stories, Anansi stories, sort of African folk stories. They were African folk stories, but he totally made them up. And uh, what, and it was, you know, call it inventiveness or call it because he just couldn't be bothered. Every night it's the same damn characters, but a different story. I never thought, damn, you can't come up with something else other than Anansi and, and Brother Rabbit, but it would be the same characters in a completely different story or the same story told from somebody else. And I think it, there's something about Western storytelling that is so influenced by Christian values. That I also, we may not all be practicing Christians, but we are practicing Calvinists. And part of that is the idea that truth is an act of reduction that let's get to the bottom of it. Let's get to the truth. Let's tell the true story or the authentic story or the director's cut. And the idea that um, there's this one story is something that's very, very Western. Um, do I, I believe, the thing is, I believe Tracker when I wrote Moon Witch, when I wrote Black and Red, Red Wolf. And I totally believe Sagala when I wrote Moon Witch, Spider King. And I'm going to believe the people who tell the next story, even though their stories don't add up. And I think one of the things about older traditions, particularly oral traditions, is that they were way more sophisticated about how to respond to a story than we are. They could totally dig a story and know I don't believe a word of it. Whereas I think we still have to need this sort of, sort of proof that it happened, even in a novel. And I was like, no, I want to get away from all of that. And that the burden of belief is going to have to be the reader because I'm not going to tell them who of these three narrators to believe. Right. There's that tension, you know, in that. Mm -hmm. you have but also, that supposedly are telling the same story and yet they're telling yeah. different stories. And that unreliability becomes essential to them. Whereas mm -hmm. you compare that to sort of standard ways of telling, you know, you're, you're referencing other models. Like what about the Marvel model where everybody mm -hmm. is obsessed with continuity? and mm -hmm. what actually happened, right? Mm -hmm. And you're acting out sort of in defiance of that. Yeah. And even though you know, in a way, here we are talking about these three different books, you know where they end up in a way. Mm. Here you are moving to the next book and oh, no, no. Actually, mm -hmm. that's not the case, which keeps things, if you think about, circle back to your style, the way that you mm -hmm. approach writing, right? Mm -hmm. It suits that improvisation. Is like let's uh let's flirt with the lie. Let's flirt. Yeah, with I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm pretty much. Uh, I mean, 
I mean, all my novels so far are pretty much novels driven by voice. Um, but I'm very, I've always been very interested in what people choose to believe and what they choose not to. And, um, but I also do think you can have three versions of the same story and all three are true um, to an extent. It's, it's because so many things shape a story. We walk into a room and see somebody gobbling up a, a really huge burger. You might think he's starving. I might think he's gluttonous. Um, you know, but we're still looking at the same, we're still looking at the same data. Um, and it's, it's, I also really like to mess with the idea of reliability. Um, you know, what's a reliable narrator or an unreliable narrator? I have yet to write an unreliable narrator. So, <laughs> yeah, even though people think I write tons of them. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the, the nature of, of truth, I think, is something that, that somebody reading this, I hope, would have to sort of question. Talking about voice, mm. you know, people tend to break things down according to first, second, third, with a few subcategories within each. Mm -hmm. But we've already been talking about defiance, right? A defiance mm -hmm. of norms. When I read these books, there's a unique quality to the perspective. You know, it's like an omniscience that's mm -hmm. an implied first person, it's personality, it's judgment, it's a bossy narrator. That's how I think mm -hmm. of it, the bossy yeah. narrator. Um, and you were talking about that voice, it sounded like in tandem with like the traditions of the griot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I just love the idea of that, that mm -hmm. you say, there's no such thing. You've never written an unreliable narrator. Mm -hmm. And that certainty comes across, the certainty of like a god. Yeah. The personality yeah. of a sassy god. Mm -hmm. Sort of like your, your narrator. I'm going calling her that now. She's a sassy god. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think because it's not necessarily that these people are telling you the truth. It's that, it's that at the, certainly by the traditions of of ancient storytelling, it's not just African storytelling. If you're reading Beowulf, you have to do the same thing. Where truth is what you decide to believe, I can tell you whatever. Yep. And, and tell it with the force as if it happened to me, whether it happened to me or not is almost beside the point. You know, it's like Life of Pi. Do you want the story with the tiger or the one without the tiger? Most of us write out a story with the tiger and then we figure it out. <laughs> as opposed to... <laughs> As, you know that's, that's that's the great thing about that novel he at the end of it he he doesn't tell you if he's lying or not he throws the burden of belief on you do you want a story with the tiger or the one without the tiger and 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 you know and i've always loved that and I, and I, and it's the same thing with with this characters characters who appear in moon in black leopard do not appear in moon with spider king for example which, you know, some people in some subreddits are very upset about that they fell in love with certain characters. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, but at the same time, there is an authority that comes from being a 177 year old black woman who has zero fucks <laughs> to give. <laughs> um, you know, there is, there, there, there is a, a, an authenticity that I knew Sutherland would have that even Tracker doesn't. For this year, it's sheer fact that she's just seen more. I'm thinking now about genre. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at speculative fiction, oftentimes it's kind of a Trojan horse. Yeah. Else, right? Like, mm -hmm. this is a horror story, but it's also, this is a fantasy story, this is a sci fi story, but it's also. Mm -hmm. right. Godzilla is a monster movie, but it's also about post-atomic anxieties or Get Out is a horror movie, but it's also social commentary. And it sounds mm -hmm. like you're hinting towards a little bit of that right now, where, you know, you're talking about this 177-year-old Black woman who gives no fucks. Mm -hmm. Curious to hear you talk about the also of this novel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. How is this a story I about long ago and far away? but it's mm -hmm. also relevant to the right now. Yeah, I mean, I will say, preface, sometimes I, I get very, I know, I, I sometimes get suspicious when people drop the also. 
sometimes because if sci-fi isn't enough right you know they, 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 they that's why i've always been always been suspicious of the word the term speculative fiction right you know it's like it's sci-fi but it's a little more i'm like no bitch <laughs> a little more spicy <laughs> <laughs> you know it's it's like no you know um this is why i always I just remember. think about it as uh people pointing to the subtextual you know yeah, but it, it's sometimes it, it makes me wonder if they didn't read Ursula Le Guin hard enough. Yeah. You know, or, or for example, one of the things that classic sci-fi does, even classic sci-fi that stays within a realm of sci-fi, classic sci-fi is the only genre that dares to ask the big questions. You know, their literary fiction authors aren't asking why are we here and who control us anymore. Mm-hmm. But sci-fi is still doing that. Fantasy does that. So it's it's so there's subtext, and the subtext are sometimes bigger than everybody else's subtext. Um, but that said, I think the thing about sci-fi, although, although this is a fantasy novel, the thing about sci-fi also is that a lot of times sci-fi gets there first. Yeah, uh, just by the very nature of this genre. Um, I think the thing about fantasy for me is that fantasy fantasy novels to me are historical novels. They're historical novels if you take the world of the, the fantasy to be true. Um, I just watched The Northman um, on Saturday. And God, you're going to flip at it. I haven't seen it yet, but I, you're, my, you're loins, my loins stir every time I see the trailer. But the cool thing about The Northman, I mean The Northman, but that's a Friday slip. The thing I loved about Northman is that it's the most Norse Viking story I've ever seen. Because my problem with a lot of stories, particularly Scandinavian stories, is that they still have that Christian worldview. If I watch your Viking film or read your Viking novel and still think Valkyries are a figment of reimagination, that's not a Viking novel. And it went and it and and the, the worldview so permeates it that you really do think absolutely these people are going to Valhalla. Where else could they possibly go? The, so it's it's no longer fantasy it's the reality of the thing and and when, even when i wrote moonway when i wrote these novels i wrote them with the belief that for the people of this world and i don't mean world of fantasy i mean world where people speak yoruba this is not fantasy you know it's it's sort of our little christian upbringing that tells us witches aren't real but if you come from the world of witches they are real if you grew up in medieval europe or you grew up in pagan europe you fully believe all those things as fact. Yeah. And I think that also is one of the, 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 the crucial subtexts to understanding fantasy or the way I write it is that I had to let go of the idea that this is fantastical. I go, no, this is the real world that I'm writing about. I love that. I love that. But, also, but, it's, it's, did. but you also That's have to Robert shift your as well with uh, the witch, right? The witch is what? Was in Puritan New England, and witches yeah. are real because you're immersed in that point of view, right? But it, it's absolutely, so and I like that. I love that he took it for granted because I think sometimes when we do these stories, um, fantasy, sci-fi, comics, we we you know we 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 still have to assert that the evil witch or the swan has no power. Mm-hmm. Like I get into clashes with Christians all the time about this because I said like witchcraft has no power. I'm like. You know, if you go back to Exodus, God didn't say those other wizards didn't have power. He just says Moses was greater. He didn't say any, he didn't say witchcraft ain't the shit. Those people still turn stuff. Those people still turn state, you know, still turn sticks into slate into snakes. He never said witches don't have power. He just said he was greater than it. Yeah. And I, you know, and um part of it of you know growing up in the Caribbean. You know, Gabriel Garcia Marquez talks about he never wrote a magical realist novel in his life. That all of that is, you know, all of that happened. And I totally believe him. And I think you have to be, you have to accept that as well. I can tell when a writer don't believe the world he's writing. You know, I can tell. And hell, I can tell when it happens in nonfiction. I can tell when, and you have to, I left these novels totally believing in the world that I wrote. I love that. I love that because it it makes me think of, you know, Brandon Sand- Sanderson is kind of like the king nerd right now with his mm-hmm. $30 million Kickstarter. <laughs> um, I just yeah. had a thought with Brad. Oh, he's a sweetie. 
He's a sweetie. He's a sweetie. But, I, but I just, you can't uh, help I just but resent him for his $30 million. But he yeah, talks a lot that about money still. But he, I just had a talk with him. He talks a lot about magic systems, right? Mm -hmm. On his website, he has essays and essays and essays about magic systems mm -hmm. and how you need rules for your fantasy world, right? And, mm -hmm. and so you can look at uh, Ursula K. Le Guin, who you were talking about before, mm -hmm. and naming is so essential to her. You yeah. name different things. If you look at them closer, if you study them deeply, and if you name mm -hmm. a thing, it will respond to you. And you can, mm -hmm. you can command it. That's right. how Ged gains his power. It's very similar to what Patrick Rothfuss does with the name of the wind, right? Mm -hmm. The naming. Uh, N.K. Jemison, you know, she gets into the geomancy. Yeah. You know, sort of elemental powers in her Broken Earth trilogy. Mm -hmm. And they're like building a specific set of laws that serve as a guidebook for the world. But I love how you're in a way like just saying to hell with all that. And it's the mm -hmm. point of view that is the magic system. Yeah, but also that the magic system for these people aren't magic, right? And I think, and I think it's it's or it's not it's or rather or rather no. Let's say put it a different way. It is magic, but magic has the same credence reality and religion have for us. Yeah. So it's it's not it's not a you know it's not something that that's separable. It's okay. um. You know, move, um, Black Liberal do, does this more where they, where instead of magic, they just call it black math. <laughs> yeah, you know, and and or, or white science and so on. Um, that I, yeah, I think um, the, the there is also something very sort of sensual and carnal about the, the 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 magic and the, the creatures in this thing and um and they're probably more in my but they're probably more creatures than magic um and more sort of supernatural beings than than um so on you know sure. than um spells and conjurers and so on i mean the closest we come to a conjurer maybe is a, is a easy but easy does have his rules um and you know it's 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 Part of it, it's you know, Sogolum comes as as such a breaker of all those things. But I also think that a lot of those rules again follow a very Western idea of what can happen in a story. And um, I didn't, I certainly didn't want to write basically a Western fantasy novel in brownface, right? Which would have been easy to do. Yeah, well, uh, if anything, it kind of laughs of it. May, you know, my magic child who will deliver us is no magic child. He's kind of a freak. And I want to lean into that, like the idea that when we think about canonical works of, of fantasy, it's oftentimes through the Western lens, right? The Arthurian mm -hmm. or the, the, the Tolkien journey. Mm -hmm. um, and those stories oftentimes have to do with, with virtue and mm -hmm. chivalry. And uh, these traditional notions of of heroism, mm -hmm. and and I'm curious about how you incorporated but upended those tropes, and yeah. in particular when it when it comes to like moral ambiguity, mm -hmm. the moralism. Because yeah, well, I mean, even even a novel, even even the, the his dark materials novels. Which in some ways set it set themselves against the religious Oxford Don novel, you know whether it's whether it's C.S. Lewis or Tolkien, the fact that you're it's like you know there there are few there are few there are few comes that's more Christian than a devil, you know that even in that risk even in in the way in which that novel breaks against that not that tradition. It's still it's still in the context of the tradition. It's break it, it's in reaction to it. Which is not a diss at all, because I, I flipping love his dark materials. I realized that if I had written a novel that was in reaction to that, I'm still using that as a context. Mm -hmm. So it can't just be these are virtuous knights, I shall have evil knights, or these are dominated by this character, you know, or these have the knights and the evil ones are the orcs. Well, let us make the orcs good and it's such and such bad. Although that's not a bad idea. But <laughs> um, but I yeah it to me it's it was to re remember that it's not those worldviews at all, 
Um, you know, and sometimes we talk about the giants of the giant legendary books of fantasy. Isn't that sometimes we forget that everybody grew up with Arabian Nights, which also, you know, got there a long time um, there. And, and then the worldview in that is so different. So it's, it's, it's what I said before, that even people who aren't practicing Christians tend to be practicing Calvinists, that there's still a kind of virtue what will be rewarded kind of thing and good and evil should be very clearly set apart although not everybody follow that so you know it's it's it, i think it's too dismissive to say that lord of the rings good is known as good and evil is known as evil then where do you put Gollum? <laughs> yeah where do you where do you put where do you put not the evil or the good but simply the pathetic mm -hmm. which is what Gollum is um so it's yeah, and um, but yeah, to, to there is always this voice in the back of my head reminding me. Remember, you're not writing a fantasy. You're not writing Western stories. I mean, writing English was concession enough, I think. So I had to keep watching that, and it's it's not just the plot or the stories. How would they react to it? What's the worldview here? So I'm thinking about. Sogolon. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about, you know, a, a kind of, with what you're saying in mind, a kind of feminist revisionary lens through mm -hmm. which to understand the story, as well as a sort of a moral repudiation of traditional Western fantasy. But I'm also thinking about comic books. Mm -hmm. Right? In, in comic books, every character, every main character, actually a lot of them, the, the side characters, well, they have a they have what's called a key insight or a core wound to them, mm -hmm. right? Batman, his parents were murdered in crime alley. Right, right, right. And 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 that gave rise to this vigilante who wants to bring law mm -hmm. and order to Gotham because of the chaos, the raw chaos mm -hmm. in that moment. Or Spider-Man, his uncle was killed by burglars, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what makes the Spider-Man, not the radioactive spider. It's that moment. Right. The tragedy right? or the, the formative experience. Yeah. And, and you know, oftentimes the, the villains of the story are externalizations of some internal conflict, mm -hmm. right? Like the Joker is an embodiment of chaos mm -hmm. The the Batman fights or, or Scarecrow is an embodiment of the fear that mm -hmm. he experienced and, and so forth, so on and so forth. Um, and, and when I think about Sogolon, I, I, I wonder about this, like the, the abuse and the neglect mm -hmm. that she suffers at the start of the novel and how that becomes generative for her. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head here. And, and this is a, 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 a more a bigger answer because I, I went to that question is that, you know, one of the things about my formative experiences with writing fantasy stuff and speculative stuff and wild ass shit is that the, the core influence for me was comics. Like, I didn't read Lord of the Rings until after the movies. You know, I'm still trying to get through Dune. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I've read, I've, read, um, uh, I've read Wheel of Time and I read Patrick's stuff. Um, and you know, Gene Wolfe is my god. But a lot of my for, the things that the things that shaped me were comics, particularly X Men, X Men, Teen Titans, and Batman. Um, I still have. I can still, you know, I can still tell you panel for panel the who, the who is Donna Troy in in Teen Titans story. You know, I mean, Judas contract. I mean, I'm pretty sure I cried at the end of it. <laughs> And I mean, where do I begin talking about X Men? I didn't know you were such a Deathstroke fan. Yeah, <coughs> got conflicted feelings. But I mean, and then of course X Men. You know, reading X Men in the eighties was a lot like being an X Man because I was a nerd and I've always tried to help the cool kids. I mean, I used to do the cool kids' homework for them, and they just turn around and loudly reject me the next day. And I'm like, oh my god, I am a mutant. I am, I am <laughs> serving the world. That hates me. I have a total mutant. Where I'm going with this is that a lot of the way in which my characters are shaped still come from that. 
that 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 formative experience and for and and for Sutherland, yes it's childhood and so on but i mean Sutherland is also driven by sometimes the stuff done to her you know um near the end of the book she has this sort of kill list yeah uh i saw so she she is driven by that um and then also the the character you know one of the things about about um Charles Xavier, I'm not calling him Xavier because that's not right. It's Xavier. One of the, the thing about Xavier and Magneto is it's not just clashing people, it's also clashing a clashing version of uh, at the core of it irrefutable worldviews. If you if you take away all the violence and so on that have been done in their names, neither view is superior to the other, not really. And and in 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 Moonwitch, Sogolon and the AEZ are also clashing two worldviews. The AEZ has this idea that if we don't have a strong monarchy, which as it is, we won't with, be able to withstand what's coming. And I never say what's coming. I mean, it could be colonialism, it could be slavery, it could just be Europe. I never say what's coming, but he knows if we don't have a united under one guy, we won't withstand it. Whereas Sutherland's worldview is if you start corrupt from the beginning, nothing good can ever come. So no matter how many kings you're going to bring on, if the beginning was terrible, it will always be terrible. And it's, and it's, but he, and it's, it's, is it Professor Zebra Magneto? Of course it is. <laughs> yeah, but it's, again, those, th those things that shape the way it's still, you know, it's still shaped the way I tell we tell a story you know i mean couple before in the middle of this pandemic when things were eased i finally met chris claremont i went to see the god himself you know i said poor chris he has all these authors coming around to gush over him every minute yeah. also <laughs> poor chris he's got all these other writers playing with his toys right now i know uh uh he's not very happy with me He's not happy with a lot of the. Re he's not. I'm not sure he's that happy with um with with Jonathan either. Yeah. It's it's we got into that, and yeah. I'll just say this. I said, well, you know, Chris, you know, for every Martin Luther King, there probably has to be a Malcolm X, and maybe because you know, it's it's there is something about about. House of X, Powers of X, that really struck me. Yeah. You know, what if, what if, you know, what if it's time to stop believing in the better nature of people? What if it's time to start realizing there's no justice, just us? And in a, and yes, I could bring all sorts of Black Lives Matter parallels and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and I think, I think I, I understand where Chris thinks it's a huge turn into a kind of cynicism. Whereas I think maybe it's a huge turn in realizing that, you know, you, the person to save you is you. Yeah. And that maybe that, you know, it's, it's, yeah, I get it. It's, it's, it's a, re, it's a realization. You know what? Human beings are going to be human beings. They're going to be human beings. They're not going to change. I mean, need to start depending on us. Man, did we go off tangent, but we're talking about next. But, like, but, you know, to swing it back, like the mutants stood up and mm -hmm. said, that's enough. Yeah. And so did Sogolon. Seriously. It's like, you know, I, I mean, Sogolon also, you know, uh, um, you know, Sogolon, and this, I guess, <laughs> will answer the inevitable question about violence that I'm sure I'm going to get from somebody. Sogolon witnesses a, a tons of atrocity. One of the things, one of the ironies about Moonwitch is that nearly every person in the book who dies for witchcraft is not a witch. You know, they've been called that out of this huge persecution, this huge inquisition that happens. And any woman, it got to the point where a husband, if he wants to get rid of the old wife for a young wife, calls her a witch, which, which, which by the way still happens in a lot of these societies. So it's, it's you know, I'm very much, I was interested in, we're, we're talking before about the, the, the subtext and the other things the books are about. Um, I was very much interested in mass hysteria and mass paranoia and very much interested in persecution and actual, what is, what is, that, what is an actual witch hunt? 
Um, a lot of these simply boil down to, you know, the good old war on women, which has been raging for a few <laughs> a few centuries now. So yeah, I, I to tie it back to our previous question about the different layers and stuff that's in that novel. That that's what that's that's also some of the things that I was I was very much interested in writing about in covering. I love that response, and I am now supposed to, uh, according to my overlords at Powell's, mm -hmm. I'm supposed to bring in some of the Q and A questions here, and one I... of them is, is actually tapping into something I wanted to ask you about as well. Mm -hmm. uh, this comes from Patrick Robel. A while ago, I seem to recall an anecdote. This is this is me talking, not Patrick right now. But a, a while ago, I, I seem to recall an anecdote about you and Dave Eggers in a bar, <laughs> drawing a map, drawing a map of, of the world, uh -huh. of this world on, an, on a cocktail napkin. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm wondering how generative that discussion, that moment was. And Patrick wants to know something similar. He wants to know about these maps. The yeah, the well, like, that, that moment with Dave was thoroughly useless, but lots of fun, because then we had things like Lake of Anui. <laughs> There is also a part on that map that was simply said, don't go there. Um, that's because he heard I was drawing a map. So that map would serve no constructive purpose other than the fact that we were both pretty drunk. <laughs> <laughs> we felt like drawing a map in a bar and everybody was like, man, look at these nerds. <laughs> um, as for the maps, yes, I drew them, I drew them myself. Um, and it was a it was there were two stages to it. Well, three if you count the actual doing good, learn, reteaching myself Illustrator Adobe, and Photoshop and all that stuff. But um, I knew that even though the worlds were new to me, they can't be new to the characters. So I can't have them move around like a tourist. And I think that's sometimes, sometimes happen in fantasy novels that I read, where every time they turn somewhere, they have to give me the, the, the cliff notes or the, 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 the encyclopedia definition of that territory. You don't. Because if, if your character has gone on that road a million times, I don't want a description that they've been there the first. But, but you can't just do that. You have to get there. Like, I think I can write a novel about St. Paul, Minnesota. And I, don't, I think I can just have the characters move through it because I know St. Paul. Um, I know Minneapolis, I, you know. So, but what, what I'm getting at is that I had to get to a point in the fantasy world where I could just move through it which means I had to draw a map pretty much near the beginning when I started. Um, and that map did what, um, what um, Eudora Welty says about settings. She says setting is a definer and a confiner. And uh, both are great things. I actually like being confined by a map because then I feel like I'm being restrained by the reality of the world. I can't just invent a street in New York. There's an actual street there. So it, it, it gave me, funny enough, that confining gave me the sense that I'm writing about a real place. But then the reverse, then not the reverse, but then something else happens. As you write more, you need more from your map. So there's a, so somewhere maybe after page 200, 300, I actually have to then draw this map for real. Because no, I do need a street. I do need a, a street A that's different from a street B. And I can't keep saying he went down the narrow road. I have to give that road a name or I'm going to confuse it with the other narrow road. So it's the maps spark the first pages of the books, but then the books start to spark the map. And, and, it, and it's a going, it's a going back, it's a back and forth. And I love that. No, I could write a scene. I go, no, can't write that. That's not, that's not where it is on the map. Or we have to go south, not north. And um, and yes, yeah, so I end up drawing. They're so end up drawing these maps again and again and again, um, until you know I'm finished the book, and then I have to like draw them for real, and then I have to go back and reteach myself all these illustration software, which I haven't had to do since I was a graphic designer. And um, and it was a lot of fun, honestly. It was tons of fun. I would. You know, I do it for other people. Hey, I take requests. I'm just not cheap. Um, but yeah, it was it was fun to 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 keep drawing that and to then feel as if I'm writing about a place that actually exists, which is how the characters have to act. I can act as if it's fantasy all I want. The characters have to act as if it's the real world. And you mentioned you're a graphic designer. I guess it's uh, no surprise that the covers of your books 
kick ass. Yeah, I didn't kids. design them though, but I was a I was a complete. But I'm sure I'm sure you were right there. Wow, I was that guy. I <laughs> I said I would never. Having been a designer, I've had to deal with that guy who thinks he knows design. Man, I totally became that guy. <laughs> well, paid off. the covers do look better because of it. I think they're gorgeous. Uh, here's a great question. It's a heavy one mm -hmm. from Linda Bond. Uh, she talks about having a similar background experience, Pentecostal casting out. She'd love to have a spiritual conversation with you, but there's no time for that. So she's asking about your spiritual beliefs and how mm -hmm. they inform your writing. Um, you know, I come out of, I, I, you know, of course, come out of the same Christian tradition I keep reeling against. Well, I'm not reeling against it. I, you know, I am actually quite grateful um, for the time I spend in church. And I still, in a lot of ways, have that worldview. Um, when I hear all these people teaching about joy now, I'm like, oh, you're just learning that? <laughs> that was me 20, 15 years ago in church. But good, but great. Um, so there is a lot of that worldview I still have. But reading these books and researching these books, you know, because... Well, go back. I started writing these. When I started researching, it wasn't for these books. It was me realizing what it means when you don't have your mythology. And I use this example. I gave the, the when I gave the J.R. Tolkien lecture a few years ago. I talk about this, about what it means when you can take your mythologies for granted. That um, you, if you're a British person, you don't have to think about King Arthur much. But King Arthur is actually crucial to your to your being as a British person, because Arthur, Gawain, Lancelot, even Mordred, harks back to this era of chivalry, and it gives this idea that Britain was always sophisticated. Britain was always chivalrous. Britain was always a place of courtly life and courtly love, except. If you really go back to the time where the myths of Arthur were formed, that place was the most backward flipping backwater in all of Europe. Julius Caesar was appalled when he got to that dingy ass place. But the mythology is important. Now what happens for somebody like me who grows up without those mythologies, who grows up without this foundational idea of who I am? For me growing up, Ground Zero was slavery. And you rarely were taught beyond that in, in, in high schools, in my high schools, at least we were taught it. But we really went beyond that. And I just started to feel there is a part of me personally that's missing or haunted because I don't have the mythologies at the back of me. So to come back to the religious question, it's not necessarily that I was necessarily looking for my religion. I became convinced that your mythology is a crucial part of your makeup and I didn't have one. So, yeah, I, I found myself, that's why I say I believe the stuff I write in Moonwitch Spider King. I'm not making this shit up. I do believe in these vampires. I do believe in them to an, ex to, to an extent, but I, do, I, I couldn't write it unless I believed it. Or at least, you know, accept that this is real for, for somebody. And I think that's what happened in this book, that, that my idea of spirits and demons and gods and goddesses and fairies and mermaids and all of that got blown wide open where I had to believe them to write it. That's a killer response. There's, of course, uh, the inevitable question about the transition to film and to TV. Mm -hmm. Some of your books are experiencing right now. Can you talk about that? I don't know if you're allowed to talk about What's happening with these books? I know that you know, right now you are in Jamaica. I am in Jamaica about to shoot a TV show. You're on set. You're on set. The funny thing is the TV show is funny because almost all my books, and, and every writer knows this, when you go through option and development hell, you know, everybody signs their books and then it takes 10 years for them to even happen. Funny enough, the one original screenplay I wrote, that's the one we're filming. I was like, damn, is, is this a statement on my books? So, so, you know, so I've been Jamaica filming, we're filming a detective show that I wrote, it's an original screenplay, and I wrote this detective show to get rid of everybody, 
because they kept harassing me to write a, a treatment. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to write something. I'm going to write a black Jamaican heroine in a story that has 99% Jamaicans and nobody will understand what the hell we're saying. Nobody will like it. And now here we are filming it. So that goes to show. Um, as for Black Leopard, of course, COVID put two years on everybody's timetable. Um, it's still, we're still moving ahead. We are, you know, we, we're working on a script. I'm not, but we're working on a script and we're, you know, we're, we want to move ahead with it. No, before they were ahead of me, no, I'm ahead of them because I've finished Moon Witch. Um, but yeah, it's, that's, that's as much as I can say, honestly, is that it's moving ahead and know that we're trying to jump back on, you know, jump back on the whole process, know that we, you know, COVID has laid us down for two years, but that's where we are. We've got time for one more question. Mm -hmm. So how about this one? Kevin Rappel wants to know, what is the last book you read that really blew your mind? Oh my God, the last book I read that really blew my mind is not coming out yet. It's, 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 it's this novel called Age of Vice by this writer from Delhi called Deep T. Kapoor. And if anybody has seen me on Facebook, they've seen me exclaiming about this book day after day. I was wondering what that book was that you were being I, very curious about. It's, it's, wow, that book blew me apart. Um, funny enough, it, I think it's already out. In, it, it, it came out in, in India, I think, last year. But it was just, yeah. I mean, I, I remember the part where I put up on Facebook where, Oh, well, actually, I didn't put it up on Facebook. I was reading it, and um, I, you know, my partner Nick was there, and I said, "Oh, oh, it kind of, it finally flew off the rails." Yeah, but it was a good ride. And then I was already thinking of, but you know, it's it's an eighty percent great book. It just fell off here, and and I'm like that reviewer who's like, "Here's the part where it, I will talk about how it fell off here, but you know, it regained its momentum." And, um, and then this book just started to skid and slide and slide and slide more. And I'm like, girl, where are you going with this? And she just slides it into the most perfect plot twist I have ever read. And I went, pardon my, my French, I went, motherfucker. <laughs> I was like, how? How did you do that? I, it, I mean, I was screaming because I thought this book is done for. And she turned that crazy stuff and made it work. And I've been gushing about that book ever since. Age of Vice by Deep T. Kapoor. It comes out in January. Age That's the last book that mm -hmm. made me forget myself. Nice. Well, everybody's got to pre-order that. But they also have to order Marlon's book right now. Because I need the that, money, man. that, friends, is a show is the show <laughs> that's a wrap <laughs> so thanks for thanks for bullshitting with me man it was good to hang out and uh thanks to pals for hosting us yeah and i'll humble of you not to mention the ninth metal your last book and that you're doing x lives and x deaths of wolverine which is flipping amazing hey, one of those it's one of those comics which i think have gotten people to actually go and buy the actual 22 page comic <laughs> trade paperbacks are nice but people are actually going back to buying the actual comics. And I think that's fantastic. And you're a part of that. Uh, I can't believe I'm a part of that. Despite the fact that I'm irritating Cl Chris Claremont by playing with his toys. But Wolverine's my favorite. I'm enjoying the ride. Sorry, Chris will get over it. <laughs> All right. Thank you both for joining us. Um, this is a great conversation. Love to see it. Um, I posted in the chat all the links to the books that you can uh, purchase here from Powell's. And then if you want to join us for another event, just check out the events page and we'll see you there. Bye, everyone. All right, folks. Thanks for hanging. See you, Marlon. All right, man. See you soon. Bye.